Good afternoon or good evening to wherever our audience uh, is at the moment. Uh, I'm Michael Kimmich. I'm chair of the Kennan Institute Advisory Council and a professor of history uh, at Catholic University. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to return after something of a hiatus to, uh, to the Longview uh, deep dive interviews and discussions uh, with key thinkers about the post-Soviet uh, space. Uh, and that takes me very naturally to uh, an introduction for our guest uh, today, uh, Dr. Uh, Gwendolyn Sass, uh, who we're delighted to have with us um, uh, for today's conversation. And Professor Sass has been the director uh, of the Center for East European Inter International Studies, uh, you know, if you would refer it by its refer to it by its German acronym, you would say Zeus, um, uh in Berlin since its establishment uh, in 2016, and had before that uh, a distinguished uh, academic career, and is currently, in addition to being director of Zeus, uh, the Einstein Professor for the Comparative Study uh, of Democracy and Authoritarianism uh, at the Humboldt University uh, in Berlin, a position that she has held since uh, 2021. Uh, her research has ranged across uh, many different fields, democracy and authoritarianism, obviously, protest, war, uh, displacements, political remittances of migrants, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Europe, uh, you know, sort of all in, 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 in one package. Uh, and we're here today to talk about uh, a recent book of Professor Sass's, uh, the German title is Der Krieg gegen die Ukraine. Uh, but the book has also come out uh, in English, fortuitously for, for us and for, for readers in this country. Uh, and the title of this book is Russia's War uh, Against Ukraine, which appeared with Polity Press in September of 2023. And let me mention for those of you uh, looking on that there is a discount count code uh, in the chat. Uh, and so anybody who wishes to order the, uh, the book, you know, sort of immediately uh, or during this conversation can do so uh, at a... Uh, at a discount. And I will mention as well for our viewing audience that we are delighted to get your questions. We very much want to include you uh, in the conversation. So please uh, send a question to the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, if one occurs to you now or in the midst of our conversation, we'll speak for roughly 45 minutes. Uh, and then we'll turn to the audience's questions, which I will uh, read out for, uh, for Professor uh, Sass. So uh, a warm welcome, Professor Sass, to the long view. Long view. We're delighted to have you with us, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. And so I'd like to uh, begin our conversation uh, about this book um, by asking you not about the book, uh, first and foremost, uh, and not about the war in Ukraine, at least the war circa 2022 uh, to the present moment, but to go uh, into your own academic uh, background. Uh, and here I'd like to just mention a few uh, books that have appeared uh, prior to the one about the war uh, against Ukraine. Uh, and this would be in 2007, a book that came out with Harvard University Press titled uh, The Crimea Question uh, that was reissued in paperback uh, in uh, the important year of 2014. Uh, uh, prior to that, a book uh, exploring issues on related to ethnicity and territory. Uh, and then most recently, a 2021 publication uh, on post-Soviet uh, secessionism. Uh, and it seems to me that many of the books that have come out, most of them perhaps uh, on the war that we've all been witnessing for the last year and a half, uh, many of them have been written by journalists. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, journalists have the benefit often of being eyewitnesses to, to big events uh, and journalists are sort of up against uh, the latest developments uh, in high politics, but it's often my feeling when I read these books and sometimes when I read journalism about the war uh, that there should be more context. And so it's that that I wanna uh, ask you about, the kind of academic scholarly context that for you were most important before you sat down to write the book that you know you were able to work into the, uh, to the analysis of something uh, that's happening before your eyes. So I just wanted to ask about which academic fields of inquiry, which publications, which kinds of research were most useful to you uh, when you set out to write this book? You mean my own and then my own um, engagement with issues? Yes. Um, yeah. Clearly that uh, that book on Crimea that I actually developed out of my dissertation that was written in the mid to late 1990s and then was published in the 2000s 
was an important um, background for me. I mean, that was Crimea in a very different uh, time period. It was in the 1990s, a case study of why conflict or war could have occurred, but didn't. So it's a very different context from what we saw uh, from 2014 onwards. But I think one that nevertheless, I think in that period um, still, still holds. And it got me very familiar with the region. And I, I would say with the country um, overall in that period, sort of Kiev and Crimea, Simferopol negotiating the status of that region within the Ukrainian state. And if we think that even sort of today or also around 2014, that issue has has come up a lot in terms of saying on the one hand and international policymakers have said the same I think in the public debate as well yes it's a breach of international law the annexation and then often it was followed by a sort of but um, but wasn't it always Russian um, Crimea so that really takes me back to the beginnings really of my my academic path because that's clearly not the case and and, and Crimea has a much longer history and there are reasons why um, I say we in the West um, have mostly focused on the link to Russia or the Russian Empire. So that's really what is happening today is, is also was already a component part of my research then. Um, and in, the, in that period, the Ukrainian state, state managed and managed quite well to integrate a region that is historically specific, but nevertheless a part of the, of the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian polity. And that really, I think, provides the important starting point to say what happened in 2014 is not anything that starts in the region, but it starts in Russia, it starts in Moscow, and it surprises the Crimean population, it surprises Ukraine, and also, I would say, surprised the Russian public. So I think that in that sense, that was the most direct background, um, but then I've subsequently done research on Ukraine, but also more broadly on Central and Eastern Europe. And I've been interested in issues of conflict, of tension, different types of, of conflict um, around minority issues, around territorial issues. Um, and also I've been interested in um, earlier EU accession processes. So also that now I think becomes even more relevant than it was already with regard to Ukraine. And um, one more recent focus was a focus on, together with colleagues on, protest, mass mobilization, what brings people into um, the street to protest. And Ukraine is a case where we've seen that repeatedly and that in the broader comparative study of, of protest is actually, protest in general is something rare, but it's even more rare that it happens several times, several cycles within a very condensed period of time. So I think a lot of these themes I'm interested in, Ukraine has provided, um, uh, for better or for worse, of course, one has to say, um, uh, examples that we need to study and understand. And they also tell us things um, about Ukraine, of course, about Russia, about Eastern Europe, but also um, more broadly in the comparative study of these phenomena. Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer. <laughs> not in the least. It's not a not a simple set of uh, uh, of, of scholarly challenges that you're uh, that you're outlining. I'd like to ask one other question just about uh, background and scholarship and 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 how one comes to uh, conceive of a book. Uh, and you know, just returning to the publication date of 2007 for the book that you published on uh, on Crimea, it's of course a very lively uh, and often controversy uh, filled debate at the present moment uh, uh, in which you've been an eloquent participant about what it means to study Russia, what it means to study Ukraine, um, you know, these are questions that can be considered together to a degree they must be, uh, but they're also distinct and, and, and separate. And so I just wanted to ask you sort of prior to 2022 or even prior to 2014, you know, sort of how this came up in your research, if there were challenges that you sort of worried about at the time or sort of looking back uh, challenges that you see uh, in this regard, because I know a lot of scholars now and certainly graduate students, younger scholars are trying to conceptualize this sort of in the shadow of the war, but you came to these questions so much uh, earlier. So I'd just like to ask about that, the the way in which uh, you studied Ukraine uh, and what led you to that, and uh, if there were sort of challenges, pre-war challenges uh, in, in, in that domain. Yes, I mean, there were huge challenges and they also haven't gone away. And 
I think it is fair to say that um, the study of Ukraine um, was not that well established. Yes, there are um, scholars in different disciplines, more so I would say in history than in the social sciences, but there are uh, there is expertise. So I'm not starting from maybe the usual um, lament that there is nothing at all. So it's also a point of about um, how much that was present in both the scholarly debate, the research that was done um, is not so easy for area studies, um, and in particular for, so, for some countries is even harder than for others to place it um, so that a wide scholarly um, community sees it. Um, but then also beyond that is an even, even further step to then get that into the political public debate is, is even harder. Um, so they're not, it's not such a big field to begin with. Um, I think that is one of the, the big challenges. It was a discussion that is also in scholarly terms um, more focused on uh, on Russia, um, both uh, in terms of historical research, but also in terms of research on contemporary um, Eastern Europe. Um, that's a fact. Um, but nevertheless, I think the challenge goes beyond that. And it's, it's really about um, wanting to pigeonhole um, area studies in a wider sort of academic landscape and and that um, it was considered sort of second second rate and it didn't really deserve a place uh, among studies and this is not a methodological debate per se I mean there's a lot of quantitative good work on on Ukraine and other other places in Eastern Europe but they are claimed to be published in what is considered sort of a, a prime outlet in political science in particular um, that was sort of harder I would say uh, than when you um, handle and maybe a big data set on on the US, say for example. So mm -hmm. I, I think this is sort of there. There are dynamics and structural dynamics within academia, but then they also translate into or are partly linked to also um, a, a small space in the in the public debate um, for countries um, that are not Russia in Eastern Europe. So I'm now based in Germany. I used to be based in the UK. Um, Ukraine hardly featured. I mean, it featured um, when there was a next stage in the war. So then it, 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 it featured with that connection. It featured briefly when there was mass protest and it featured regularly when it was about corruption. But that's hardly kind of a, a, a good understanding of or representation really of, of what Ukraine also the, the study of Ukraine um, is about. So I think that's um, partly linked to kind of a wider problem and challenge um, that um, I would say, and definitely with regard to Germany, but I think it holds more generally that Russian imperialism reflected onto kind of um, scholarly debate, but also policy and public debates elsewhere, so that those Russian imperial arguments of of what matters and who controls certain certain areas or has a claim was reflected consciously and also subconsciously um, in terms of what is and isn't important. So I think that's different aspects of that challenge and we're only at the beginning of um, understanding them and hopefully addressing them. But it seemed to many an odd choice when I studied Ukraine. You asked me how I got to it. I got to it through, uh, I started also in, with political science and history with an East European focus with the Russian language. And I chose to go to Crimea on a Russian language course uh, when most people went to Moscow, St. Petersburg. Um, and from then on, I always found Ukraine more interesting <laughs> to study, but it was it seemed to many an odd choice and one that didn't seem like a good career move to many. Well, uh, those things uh, as your career tests are difficult to predict, uh, and um, it's 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 just so interesting to think about these these questions across time. I would add as a footnote, um, you know, I think that there's been a very robust and and healthy conversation about scholarship and how scholarship needs to be rethought, reconceptualized uh, in terms of the region, in terms of the various wars. I think there's been less of a conversation about the education that policymakers receive. Uh, and I think some of the problems that you describe in academia, the kind of overprivileging of the Moscow point of view, um, imperialistic or quasi-imperialistic arguments, and the sort of trickle down uh, into other academic cultures, that there is a policy dimension to the way that people are educated to think about the region, but that's uh, a conversation for uh, for another time, but um, uh, you know, it's a conversation that I think is 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 sort of necessary uh, to have. Well, um, that's all extremely illuminating uh, by way of background. I would like to turn now to uh, a few questions about the book itself, uh, and um, first of all, to ask the question uh, 
um, you know, sort of academic to academic, uh, what it's like uh, to write a, a book about a war that isn't yet over, um, that I think for all of us brings out uh, fairly strong emotions. Uh, it's an enormous uh, war in scale and scope. Uh, there have been many war crimes that has a very harrowing uh, humanitarian dimension. It's true for all wars, but uh, the size of this war uh, is 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 certainly very notable and touches on, you know, policy questions, uh, political questions in Germany, in Europe, uh, in the United States. And I just wanted to ask you what it's like uh, to do that, to take on a subject that's not maybe equivalent to the Crimea project that you did as a graduate student that felt a little bit more cut and dried, or perhaps it did, uh, uh, or perhaps not. But I'm sure that the uh, the war was not an easy question to tackle. I can understand the urgency uh, and the desire to do so, but I'd like to ask about uh, about that. Uh, and I would assume uh, that it's sort of different from your other academic projects in this regard. So that's that's the first question I'd like to ask about your book. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I never intended to write this book. Um, so the book came to me rather than me coming to to the book um, and it's it only happened because the German publisher of the book so the first German edition came out already in the autumn of 22 and so they approached me at the very end of February and asked it's a particular series written by academics it's very short it has exactly 123 pages um, it has no footnotes it's a very particular forward but always written by by academics and my first instinctive reaction was, no, I don't, I'm not going to do this. This is crazy. This is foolish. Um, and uh, why is a publisher now wanting to publish this and not before? And then the more I thought about it and also thinking about the audience um, that this type of series um, targets, if that's the right word, um, I then changed my mind and then I quickly accepted because it is trying to communicate exactly with that wider audience. So this is not an academic book in a sense, um, like my first one that came out of my PhD or out of uh, sort of other other books um, um, you or I might have been involved in. It's really one that's written for a different audience. Um, and if one wants to, and it, it is part of my sort of self-definition as an academic, um, if one wants to communicate beyond the, after all, narrow academic circle, then this seemed to be one good uh, or possible outlet. And so I said, I would try it, I would do it. Also, I normally write in English and I don't write really apart from maybe newspaper articles or, or columns um, in, in German. So also in that sense, there was uh, something, something new for me. Um, so once I had accepted it, I had underestimated knowing it's 123 pages. I thought mm, that's easily done. That's not very long. And then I totally underestimated that challenge to put what I was then trying to do and what I think I was expected to do into that format in a very condensed uh, way. Um, but at the same time, um, it might seem foolish to many to write while a war is going on, but those of you who ha have or will look, have looked or will look at the book will see it's not uh, trying to provide every detail of every stage of this war. Um, but it's trying to provide the, the background. And it was really an attempt to answer what was in particular in February 2022, but I think it's coming round and it's still important to be reminded of it, why this war um, happened. And I mean, the war since 2014, not, not only since 22, um, and to provide answers to questions that were so, um, uh, that, I, that I picked up everywhere. And there was so much demand in, in also in policy circles, but also in, in the media and the general public seemed fairly overwhelmed by what was happening. That shouldn't have been the case, of course, but as it was the case, I was hoping with that book to be um, one or to make one small contribution to that. And so it builds on, um, and it's nice that you asked me what I did before, but it, it builds on what I have researched. So I think in that sense, it might be, has, a, has an academic grounding also, I didn't mention I, I have been involved in, in ongoing projects mapping public opinion in Ukraine, which came in very useful for as a background really for this for this book as well. Um, and so I, I try to condense it and I think um, it actually provided me with structure in this really, um, uh, I mean, it's still terrible, but in these first few months where um, 
this news cycle, um, public media demand and, and everything and trying to help people in Ukraine as best one can and, and, and not being able to do enough ever. So I think writing this book actually imposed a certain structure on my day and my life um, and probably um, sort of prevented me from, from having, having other, other mental issues. So because it provided such a rigid structure with these 123 pages to actually decide, okay, I only have so many pages on this, so many pages on this. These are component parts I consider important as, as part of the background. People might agree or disagree with my choices, but the choices were made and then I wrote it. So it's a very different way in which the whole thing was written. So I knew always when I had to cut off and this is it now, this can only be <laughs> this long, this chapter. So a rather strange writing experience in impossible circumstances and not a book that tries to kind of um, uh, foresee the end of, of, of the war. So it's not that kind of a book. And thereby I also hope, and it's not a book reporting from the front line, but as a result, I hope it's a book that um, may stand the test of time in terms of um, providing information and analysis of how things developed and the way they did develop. And it will require, and it is already requiring, obviously, updates. So the English version is an updated, revised version. The structure hasn't changed. And I still stand by that. And I still want to tell the same um, story, um, as it were. But of course, um, the details need to be updated for where I really talk about the war and the English edition kept with the idea of no footnotes, a broad audience, but um, so, but Polity Press allowed me a few more pages so I could add a bit more here and there than I, than I could in the German edition. Well, I mean, I should say from, you know, the Kennan Institute's perspective, this sort of effort to communicate as a scholar to a general audience uh, and to policymakers couldn't be more in a sense, congenial. It's really what the Kennan Institute exists um, uh, exists to do. But it, you know, I'm, I'm also aware of how, how how difficult that is, given the demands of scholarship, which are to, you know, derive complicated, you know, sort of long term and in practice. <laughs> that means you usually slow to write uh, arguments uh, and to make them accessible to a general public is immensely challenging. It's it's wonderful to note in context that the book has been a bestseller. Uh, in Germany, and just with that in mind, let me mention to anybody who may have joined our conversation a little bit after the hour that it's available with a discount through the chat. And I'll mention as well, uh, for anybody who has questions, and you can certainly start sending them in now to please send them in through the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your, uh, of, your, uh, of your Zoom screen. So one additional question about the book itself, and then I'd like to turn to a few questions about uh, its implications and uh, where your thinking is at the present moment about this uh, about this topic. But I want to circle back to something that's there in the title of both the German book uh, and the English language book. And this is uh, the preposition uh, gegen or uh, against. Um, and it seems to me like the more dry uh, title would have been Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, we have from Serhii Plochi's book, uh, the Russo-Ukrainian War, which I think is, you know, uh, makes a kind of sense, but that's not a phrase that's really stuck when it comes uh, to this war. Um, so those are, you know, three possible choices, the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, the Russo-Ukrainian War, and the one that you selected, the war uh, against Ukraine. And I wanted to ask you about this particular uh, emphasis and, and, and what you meant by that as an author and what you wanted readers to, to pick up from uh, from this title, because it is truly a, it's a notable title. Yes, it was very important to me, um, the title, and so I discussed that also with both with publishers, and, and both were immediately um, amenable. Um, and I think terminology matters, and it matters um, even more so in war times, but it, it, man it matters generally. Um, and it still um, um, irritates me that every day we hear in the media Ukraine war, the Ukraine war. So that sounds as if it's a war that Ukraine has partly caused, um, or that's entirely of its of Ukraine's own own making. Um, Russia's war in Ukraine is only, I think, a little little bit um, uh, more precise. And I really, a Russo-Ukrainian war is, I suppose, the most neutral way in which you can describe it. Um, without, it's not wrong, but it it sounds quite neutral. It makes both parties um, even or equal. But um, to me, it was more important to highlight what this war is about and, and to actually make 
very clear that this war is about the destruction of Ukraine as a state and as a nation. And I thought, both in German and then also in English, that this term, the war against Russia's war against Ukraine, makes that more obvious um, and could also be the phrase or should, in my view, be the phrase that we use when we discuss this to be very precise what, what we're actually dealing with here. So the title yeah, is, is, is really important um, to me and I see it as one way of trying to correct this constant reference, the Ukraine war, which, which really makes it sound like an internal war and then we're not very far away from the Kremlin's own labeling of, of it as a civil war and everything that makes it an internal Ukrainian um, issue. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to turn now to um, a few questions uh, about uh, the broader implications uh, for the book and and to ask first about, uh, I know that you've mentioned the general reader and uh, I think the general reader in Germany uh, found his or her way to the book and I think the same will be true uh, for the English language book, but I want to ask about policymakers because you mentioned that as well uh, as an audience that there was a demand at the beginning of the war for 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 context, there was a kind of mood of, uh, of, of perhaps desperation even to understand what the nature of this conflict uh, was um, and I'm curious to ask what it is that you're that you were trying to communicate uh, to policymakers. Um, you know, I'm curious. I'm going to ask the question in sort of two forms, but let me just start first with maybe German slash European uh, policymakers. I mean, Germany is a very very significant country when it comes to Minsk diplomacy after 2014, Normandy format, uh, EU sanctions on on Russia for the annexation of Crimea and incursion into the Donbas. Uh, in 2014, and Germany has been extremely significant since February 2022 uh, in many, many different uh, ways. And so, um, you know, if you were a scholar in, um, uh, you know, Argentina, uh, you might write the same book, but I don't think that you would have the same conversation with uh, the policymakers in your midst. So I want to ask about what you had in mind when you wrote the book, uh, and what is it that you were most eager to communicate to, to, to German policymakers, whether in 2022 or sort of 2023, um, or perhaps even now, if you would if you would ask them to read the book, what is it that you would want them to learn? I think one point is a maybe more general message, but it resonates, I, I hope, um, particularly or maybe even differently in, in, in Germany, but it's a wider um, uh, point really, or a bigger point. And, and I start the book with um, trying to explain why this war, and again, this war thin, since 2014 happened, and why this escalation now or since, since 2022. And uh, wars are complex matters, so it's partly um, an argument against simple phrases like it is Putin's war, a phrase that was particularly prominent in Germany um, right after the full-scale invasion started, but it's not um, restricted to Germany. We, we do hear this term elsewhere, and there we're back also with terminology again. This suggests that it's an aberration and it's the person at the top of an authoritarian system deciding everything and having um, caused this war. This is too simple, and, and so by um, outlining in, in, in this case sort of seven different developments that um, made the war of these dimensions more and more likely. I focus in particular on the axis, sort of the tension between and uh, the juxtaposition between um, uh, Russia as, a, as an authoritarian system and Ukraine as a democratizing um, state and society, and that this is really what the war is about. It's not um, per se about NATO enlargement and a lot of other things. I think it's really ultimately about this fundamental choice between different political systems. And that explains also why Russia under Putin, but with others around him and with a society that has also um, been developed as an authoritarian society for many years years, in fact, since 1991, I, I think it's a continuous development. And that might be an additional point. That's not how it was seen for the long time, for a long time, um, that um, this is actually a continuous trend and not one that all of a sudden starts and Putin changes his mind and starts as a Democrat, that then is something else. 
This is not true. I mean, you can go back to the Yeltsin era. That's already not a democracy and a democratic leader. And it's a continuous, then, of course, increasing or strengthening um, trend and, and building this um, ever more centralized authoritarian system. But that is ultimately what it's about, and that the, a, a democratic flourishing Ukraine on, Ukra on Russia's border would be a danger to Russia as a system. So it's a war about the self-preservation of the authoritarian system in Russia as it exa exists today. And society and how society has been prepared for this for many years through um, memory politics, propaganda, you name it, um, delegation of power, loyalties that are created uh, among the elites. Um, that is, I think, really at the heart of it. But then there are other developments which um, reinforce the likelihood that the war could escalate. And one important one, and this is where um, uh, Germany, um, among others, but Germany in particular features, is that there are also um, developments that the West is part of, uh, Europe, the EU, Germany is part of or was part of, that made um, uh, this war and the escalation more likely. And there's a contradiction in Western policies, and in, in the German case, it's most um, sort of glaringly obvious what it is. On the one hand, um, under Chancellor Merkel, Germany was among um, the countries or the governments uh, enforcing and enabling a sanctions regime, a first one, which we now know was small and weak compared to what was still possible later on. But after 2014, um, I mean, the Kremlin was even surprised that the EU could even issue sanctions at all. Um, and then uh, Germany was a part of actually keeping them in place, renewing them all the time. That was already not a given that that would happen inside the EU. Um, but at the same time, while doing that, and I'm not saying this could have solved everything, but at least that pointed in one direction, sanctioning Russia. But in the meantime, you pursue Nord Stream 2. So um, making it obvious and making it obvious to Russia and to the Kremlin that ultimately economic arguments will win and you get the cheap gas and uh, uh, therefore whatever pressure you try to exert somewhere else, ultimately um, uh, basically the economic considerations will win or create that space. Um, and these um, contradictions um, created more room for maneuver for, for Russia and Russia, Russia used it and, and systematically escalated and tested kind of that, that, that space. Um, and the longer um, the situation kind of went on and the, the gap became wider uh, between that, the rhetoric and actually what was happening in, in practice, um, again, more, more room for maneuver and also adjusting to what became the new normality through the different stages of this war um, since 2014 um, happened. But with regard to then back to, back to Germany, there's a, num a number of other sort of specific features, and I just uh, referred to it already with um, limiting it to Putin's war initially. Um, over, just to give the, the example, in, in, in the German debate, there was always a phrase that was used um, uh, that Putin isn't sort of a squeakily clean uh, Democrat, um, was the term. Uh, and But that term was so prominent. And again, it's something about terminology again. He wasn't a Democrat at all. So, But if we use that term all the time, something sticks and it builds into or it goes into this um, uh, wrong expectation that ultimately things will turn out right. And through trade and economic linkages, we secure peace and we will ultimately maybe from outside change a political system like the Russian one. It's not the only miscalculation of, of the West and, and also of um, the EU and, and Germany in this case in particular, but it's, it's one of the ones that had um, uh, dramatic uh, consequences. And I think that is one of the lessons more generally. I mean, lessons were also learned elsewhere in the world, world about this. But with regard to Russia, I think um, it's only become very clear now that from outside, the chances of actually changing um, the regime inside are extremely limited. And one, one shouldn't fool oneself um, that one can manage that or even manage um, um, kind of um, security, Ukraine security or one's own security. So this idea of um, keeping a risk manageable and calling Nord Stream a purely economic project when no project of these dimensions can be thought without um, a security context around it. Those I think are the most um, painful lessons uh, and learned rather late um, in, in Germany, but it goes further than that. So I think this assumption 
that things could be managed. Also, I mean, the US also saw Russia only still as a as a, as a country of secondary concern while focusing on China and actually underestimating the potential for um, really then regional and global global disruptions uh, caused by this. So it's a wider issue, I think, and that is a I think a, a somewhat of a message to to policy makers. You know, wonderful. I think that your comments underscore the deep connection between understanding and interpretation, the kinds of things that we academics are engaged in and, and, and policy formation. It's not a relationship that can be separated and very often mistakes of policy <clears throat> have in their background mistakes of interpretation uh, and understanding. And I suppose the only way to set that relationship right is to have the kind of very self-critical, careful, and academically informed conversation that you're um, that you're outlining. I do want to ask about the English language book uh, in this context. I think one point I might add in the German context is that there's a lot of Second World War memory uh, that obviously Germany shouldn't erase and and has to be relevant to German politics, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis Israel or vis-a-vis -vis Russia or Ukraine, but I think there were some ways in which that memory kind of got in the way. And I, I think your book is a very helpful uh, corrective and that's uh, of interest to people outside of Germany, but probably of much greater interest within the German speaking uh, world. And so it's with that in mind that I wanna ask about uh, the English language book. Um, and you know, if there's a set of concerns that you had, you, you mentioned that you had the chance to retouch uh, the book a bit when it came out with 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 polity. If if there are sort of policy making concerns in Washington or in London uh, or elsewhere uh, that you brought to bear on 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 this version of the book, I don't think it would be quite a Second World War related. I think in the U.S., um, you know, the economic concerns are there. They're much less significant than they were for Germany uh, pre February uh, 2022. You mentioned a kind of impatience with American policymakers. I think this, this describes the kind of early Biden administration uh, for six months uh, that they were in power, that they wanted to focus on China, and they made this a kind of second order uh, issue. But I'd, li I'd like to ask you what concerns you might have, or if there are insights that you could uh, deliver to policymakers in the Eng English-speaking world, what, what, what they would be. Yes, I think, I mean, I, I'm not thinking of them as sort of two separately. Um, you're right. I mean, there are specifics, and I didn't talk about this, um, these references to the Second World War, uh, in particular to Germans, probably also beyond, but it's of more relevance in Germany, um, uh, is, is the fact that the Holocaust did not only, in quotation marks, happen inside Germany, you know? so that actually uh, the territory that Ukraine is part of, it's not uh, only Ukraine either, so it's a wider region in, in Central and Eastern Europe is, is a major site of that. So this argument of having, uh, it's important that you bring it up, um, that uh, there is a moral um, obligation, historical obligation on, on Germany to do something that has only ever been really thought vis-a-vis -vis first the Soviet Union, and that then was written on as Germany, uh, as Russia, so Germany and Russia, um, which is, of course, uh, entirely wrong. So it's about this not conflating also the Soviet Union with Russia today and actually bringing a whole region into, into focus. Um, so that, I think, is is uh, resonates clearly differently in, in Germany, but I'm not sure that it's common knowledge beyond Germany either. So I think that, that should hopefully resonate. But the broader point, I think, is to to think about and and there's a bit more on that in the in the English edition, um, and there will probably before you ask me, I mean future updates, there will probably be even more on that once the implications become um, even more obvious. At the moment, it's more a sense of that something fundamental is changing that we are thinking security in 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 a different way again and. Um, also at the societal level, and I think that goes beyond Germany, beyond Europe, um, and there's an acute sense um, that what what it means to live in a secure setting, um, and that a military component is an essential part of that, is at least for some countries in Europe, and maybe also if you look a little further away geographically from Ukraine and the US, to actually make that your priority and also convince the society of the fact that that is a priority, although it's not happening within your own borders and not even as in Europe, really at the heart of Europe. Um, so then I think the challenge is, is a diff these, these are maybe slightly different messages, but behind it is this um, general sense of what we think of as security and what political systems allow us um, to kind of think in those ways and what do we want to 
um, are also in the way then stand up for because otherwise um, also political systems and political values we um, I mean we as a collective West those of us who live in democracies want to uphold that security and also hard security in a military sense is part of that and it starts with communicating internally and also making um, uh, the many uh, loopholes through which inferences from outside come in um, kind of less effective but then probably at the broadest level is what could maintain the support for Ukraine and as a result support for us in a sense of for our democratic systems and our beliefs in what makes for security. Um, and there the US clearly plays the lead role. And we also see, I think, some of the scariest question marks right now about what that might mean um, if Ukraine aid now does not continue at the level um, that the US had been providing, then I think also in an already somewhat different climate in the discussion in Europe, there are potential huge risks. So I think the challenge of communicating again and again what this war is actually about, that it is about us in a sense of citizens in democratic societies, and that therefore we also as citizens and politicians in these systems need to support and support politically, militarily, economically, and for the long haul. Um, and that is becoming both in Europe around election time in particular, we've seen it in Slovakia and Poland, more elections will follow, um, that the war can be instrumentalized. Um, now we, we see the Netherlands um, in, in that category too. Um, and we obviously see it in the US with the looming presidential elections and the campaign in which um, perhaps Biden will have to sound somewhat differently from what he sounded like before. So that is, these are huge issues. So I would focus on that and there's um, discussion on that as much as is possible in a, in a relatively short book in there. And the implications of that will be where sort of the updates will be required no? because it, it changes a lot in terms of, I think, first of all, we've discussed it already at the level of perceptions, um, perceptions around security, but also perceptions about um, uh, sort of how much um, maybe also Western policymakers took a certain degree of Russian imperialism for granted um, and what needs to replace that, but also which international institutions don't function, um, how to possibly reform them. I'm not even starting on the UN, but we see the limitations so clearly, but maybe more manageable, but still a big decision is um, the commitment to um, EU membership for Ukraine and Moldova and possibly Georgia. So that is a major rethink. Um, without the full-scale invasion, it's hard to imagine that we would be with regard to EU membership there where we are now. But these will, this whole process will change also Europe and the EU and probably transatlantic relations. Um, and I'm not saying for the worse, I think for the better, but it will be very far reaching implications. We couldn't have thought of that. It will be a very different EU. It will, will be a, probably one day a different NATO and a different um, uh, global and regional configuration um, of power. Well, wonderful. I'm delighted to see a lot of questions already in the chat. I did have one further question for you about things that you might change in the book, but I think you've sort of touched on that. And if there's time remaining, uh, at the end of the hour, we have a hard stop at a, a 12.15 uh, Eastern Standard Time, but if there's a bit of time, I can sort of return to that question, but I want to make sure that our audience gets a chance to ask its questions. To the person who's asking about the discount code, please just go into the chat uh, here uh, on this uh, Zoom conversation, and you'll see the, the discount code. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with a question from Dil Jill Doherty of... of um, uh, 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 a longtime friend of the Kennan Institute, um, uh, who has been a distinguished journalist uh, for CNN uh, and, and uh, other outlets and, and, and worked in, in, in Moscow and across the region. Um, and she asks what the most effective strategy Putin used in 2014 to create the movement uh, to annex Crimea was. What would you say is the mood of the public in Crimea today? And as for Ukrainians, is giving up Crimea flatly uh, untenable? So a couple of questions there um, about uh, about Crimea. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Quite a lot of questions there already. I think the most effective strategy was that it, it was a plan that was well prepared. Putin said so later on himself. Um, but it was the surprise moment, so the surprise element that it caught, um, as I said at the beginning, it, it caught Ukraine um, by surprise, in particular in the immediate aftermath or in the latest stages, last stages of the of the Euromaidan protests with an interim government in Kiev. It, caught, it, uh, it created a surprise in Crimea and also in Russia itself and also inter more internationally. So the international um, community was was um, was not prepared for this and couldn't do anything about it. It was implemented so fast. So it was prepared um, uh, so carefully how to do it um, and how to do it so quickly. And everybody else is, is, is watching on. Um, so I think that's the, the key moment there. It um, did not, and that, that was important to me to, to emphasize, come on the back of any mobilization in, in the region itself. I mean, the Russian official rhetoric is always, um, it's about protecting um, ethnic Russians or Russian citizens, Russian speakers, um, but there was absolutely no, I mean, neither discrimination, but also no mobilization on part of the Crimean population. Crimea had been, um, ever since the first status issue in the 90s was resolved, been firmly integrated, both in terms of electoral turnout, in terms of the actual um, election results into the southeast of, of the country. So um, uh, this idea that this becomes possible, which um, we also have to say to, to some in Crimea, we don't know how many, was attractive, but it was inserted from outside. So it came only, it became only a possibility then. Nobody thought about that very much before that actually happened. But this um, surprise element and and then the strategy of kind of basically occupying, it didn't really matter, I think, whether these um, uh, special units were insignia or not. It was obvious from the start who these um, individuals were, um, but that then um, basically occupying all central um, uh, positions, uh, then very quickly moving to this fake referendum and really with repression forcing the result and we don't even know the result of the referendum really. So um, that I think is the, was the central element and of course it was part of um, Putin's strategy to also legitimize um, his own regime um, and, and it, it, it got him, it, it chimed with, um, with public opinion in um, Russia although it came, as I said, as a surprise to them and it tapped into a sense of emotions and um, sort of cultural uh, baggage and also propaganda and historical memory. So it benefited um, uh, Putin's own um, popularity uh, significantly. We don't, it's, it's hard to say what the current mood is. Also, we don't know exactly actually looking back what the mood exactly was in uh, February, 2014 when uh, Russia occupied um, Crimea was um we can in the run up to it um see uh, a little bit but we don't actually ever we will never know how many people actually supported um becoming part of of russia and then over time as far as we can see from some opinion polls that were conducted for example by levada the um the only independent um uh, polling institution in russia because ukrainians could then not really um, did not want to and could not um uh, do that kind of work for for a long time uh, show that um, what looked like at least some enthusiasm among parts of the Crimean population changed towards a more pragmatic wait and see getting on with life attitude so that's probably the only thing we can glean from those uh, figures and I can only speak anecdotally and it's not there's not been access to Crimea um, but anecdotally I I sense um, kind of more and more uncertainty and uh, nervousness, but um, that's not very scientific. So I don't have any any real data to to base that on. But if we keep in mind that there were there have been Ukrainian strikes um, hitting Crimea and the waters around Crimea, um, I think this this sense of uncertainty that everything is possible that that Crimea is now not out of bounds in this war. Um, I think that. Is is um, in, uh, that's also realized in in Crimea, of course, by the population. And the last question was: Will uh, Ukraine or Ukrainians never give up give up on Crimea? It's impossible to answer it. But at the moment, we know, and that is very obvious in in opinion poll data, um, there's no appetite whatsoever for territorial concessions. And then, of course, Crimea would be seen as such a concession alongside the other 
uh, apparently or officially um, uh, annexed um, territories, which, however, are not even fully occupied by by Russia, the other four um, oblasts. Um, uh, so uh, at the moment, I don't see any basis for negotiations on conceding territory. Um, in the end, uh, a lot and all will depend on how the war develops further. And that depends, in my view, to a large extent on what happens with Western military support and also financial support, whether Ukraine will end up in a situation where Ukraine and Ukrainians can decide when to negotiate and what to negotiate. In the end, wars will end with some negotiation. Um, or will Ukraine be pushed into that position because Western support has dropped off? So that's unfortunately, I think, the very stark reality at the moment. It's uh, incumbent on me to mention, since the topic of historical memory has surfaced in a few of your comments, that on December 6th, we'll be having a long view conversation with Jade McGlynn on her book, Memory Makers, which addresses this very topic of, uh, it's not uh, public and politicized memory in Ukraine, but public and politicized memory uh, in uh, in Russia. So for those of you who are interested in that topic, please tune in uh, on December 6th, the sort of same venue, same, uh, same time. But there are many, many other questions that I want to make sure we get to as many as possible. This one, uh, I think, is a uh, is a lovely question, uh, and we have uh, the perfect person to whom to pose it uh, uh, here on the line. Uh, the question is, what is the most important piece of advice you would provide to young graduate scholars in disciplines like history and political science who are trying to address policy circles and to reach an extra academic uh, audience? Uh, so that's, I think, a really important question. I'm just delighted that we can ask you, you know, sort of point blank what your what your advice is to younger scholars. And I think that whatever you say to younger scholars will probably apply to mid-career and, and, and senior scholars as well. Absolutely. I mean, the first and slightly flippant um, answer probably would be uh, just do it, uh, because there are a lot of um, academics out there Unfortunately, uh, some of them also um, will have a say over tenure proceedings and, and other things um, uh, who think that academics should not engage in this um, debate and that there is um, some sort of pure academic work. And then there's um, those who communicate sort of in between and, and, and maybe sort of think tanks are more in that that space or um, a journalist or um, uh, or others in NGOs and so on. But I think that's a it's a complete misrepresentation of how academia, I think, can work. And that actually it's also uh, in, in, in line with um, the demands that any major crisis um, demands that we actually uh, put expertise out there. So there's a lot of talk about evidence-based policymaking, but where's it going to come from? It's not only going to come from uh, studies that then maybe get commissioned or, or somebody a narrow circle looks at, but it's also going to come from expertise being present in different realms now of um, sort of research communication, and it could be briefings with policymakers, but I think very importantly also communicating to a wider audience, be that through particular outlets, um, be that in the social media, be that in other media outlets, be that, be that through different events targeting different audiences. And I think that's an, an incredibly important area, and I wish and I hope, and I think we're part of this process now, um, that that becomes an, an, an area that young academics um, want to be present in and that we also collectively, um, young or not so young, convince academic structures that that becomes part of also an academic career and that, that that also is a criterion for evaluations and tenure and so on, that it's not someone's private endeavor to do this in addition, because that's not, let's face it, that's not possible for most young scholars. And I happen to now run an institute um, where that was written into its DNA. I didn't do that, but it was already written into its DNA that it has to communicate to different audiences. And I was attracted to this job, but I come to it already definitely not as a young, and I don't thought, don't don't think mid career scholar either. So it's all, but it shouldn't just be a luxury of those of us who can who can do more in this realm because um, other things um, we we don't need to prove every single day. So I think it's a real and and I'm only emphasizing that because actually within academic structures that is not a small battle um, that needs to be won. But we see and we we see it in crisis situations, but we should also have it in more normal times that that expertise is present and that we can 
also distinguish between, and also audiences can, can distinguish between expertise and opinion. And both has a space in, in democracies, but often the things, and we see that also in debates um, around Russia's war against Ukraine, often um, it's not so easy to distinguish. And if anything goes, then anybody can have and voice their views. Um, we are not that far away from actually undermining and limiting the space for expertise. So I think this is an incredibly important question. So thank you very much for raising it, Danilo. Um, a lot still needs to be done, but I think it requires people um, like you probably to, to go out and, and actually do it. I mean, we often hear also from more senior academics, they don't want to do this and they don't want to be in the in the spotlight and in the limelight to, to have to communicate differently because obviously we're not communicating the whole of our research. And there is a certain skill that also I think with um, academic careers, we should keep that in mind to also learn and train how to uh, communicate certain bits of the research that can be communicated um, in different contexts. And that's not, not such an easy thing. Well, thank you so much for the, for the, for the question and also for the, for the answer to it. I'd like to turn back to the first question that was posed by Glenn Wright, who, who writes from, from Kiev. Uh, and this is a big question. What do you think drove Putin to launch a full-scale war in Ukraine rather than just keep a more low-level conflict going? In the east of Ukraine, of the kind that had existed, uh, of the kind that had existed before. So, a question, uh, not precisely about the decision to wage war, but the precisely about the decision to wage such a big war in February twenty twenty two. Yeah, this um, important question goes back, I think, also to the beginning of my book, and and we touched on it as well. I think there was a perception of a certain uh, window of opportunity from. Uh, the, the Russian political system's point of view. Um, so if it's about um, limiting any risks that emanate from a democratizing um, Ukraine, from a Ukraine that has made a clear political choice that it's orienting itself westwards towards the EU, also towards NATO, um, and demands really making its own choices, its own sovereign choices, then um, this this was part of this this window of opportunity that Putin and others uh, the political elites um, uh, spotted or saw, and they also uh, thought that this is still a, a moment of at least um, uh, some weakness on the West's part. So I think um, uh, there was a hope that uh, that the West would not um, show. The degree of unity that it did manage to show I, i'm not saying it doesn't also have um, problems and issues and we talked about this already but i think it was a perception that um now is the moment to still do this and then there is a more um uh, putin related argument this does not mean going uh, back to calling it putin's war but obviously he also and his own writings show that is concerned about his own legacy as well. So I think that element comes into, into it as well and the way in which he um, uh, basically put um, uh, pen to paper um, to uh, uh, explain his imperial uh, vision of, uh, of history and where Ukraine belongs or doesn't belong in that. It, it expresses a broader sort of um, systemic um, identity but he added his own and also his personal um, uh, touch to that. And, and, and out of that speaks to me also his legacy. And, and then we're back basically with the argument that the need to preserve the system as is or and, and doing that by expanding control um, is, is ultimately what this war is about. This takes us, your answer takes us very naturally to two questions that I'm going to bundle together because I think they are interrelated. And the first is from Denis uh, Bur 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 Burgarenko. Uh, pardon me if I don't pronounce your name uh, correctly. Do you see President Volodymyr Zelensky as being able to make progress on his campaign promises, i.e. fighting corruption and EU integration, or, ha or has all of that taken a backseat due to the war? And then the second, I think, related question from Orest Babich is the disruption, corruption, and criminality of the 1990s was traumatic for Russia and Ukraine. Could we say that both countries sought different ways out of this, uh, that Russia looked for a strong hand and a Chanyak terrain in the crime and, uh, and the oligarchs, whereas Ukraine increasingly saw the EU, its laws and standards as an example uh, of rule of law 
uh, and as a, as a as a way forward. So you know, sort of uh, Zelensky plus uh, the diverging paths of, of of Russia and Ukraine after 1991. Yes, maybe starting from the end or from the second question, although they, I agree they are related, um, it's it's worth reminding ourselves of what uh, the Euromaidan, but also before other mass protests were about, if we think of the Orange Revolution in 2004, but also um, the anti-Kuchma protests, uh, Kuchma was the president uh, in the early 2000s, in 2001 those protests happened. It was always carried by basically the middle of society, and it was against corruption and for the rule of law. So it was um, that was um, the the main driving force behind these uh, protests. Although the Euromaidan, as we know, was triggered by the then president Yanukovych not signing the association agreement with the EU, um, but that was the trigger, and probably to most people that would have been fairly abstract at the time and fairly what that agreement actually meant. But what was not abstract was that where one wanted to see Ukraine in the future, namely also with living standards uh, like in the EU, but also basically a, a system that upholds the rule of law. So that is, um, uh, I think, a powerful demonstration of where the choice for Ukraine's direction was made. And that, I, I am convinced, will also last into the post-war um, period, whenever that um, really starts. Um, I see Zelensky as somebody who he didn't really have an election program that that was his program not to have one um, and he was uh, authentic for for different reasons and mainly also because his uh, the incumbent at the time um, miscalculated and and um, sent out a much narrower message about what Ukraine was ultimately about in this army language um, and uh, faith argument. Um, but he had two uh, two points where he was a little more concrete, and that was ending the war, meaning uh, ending um, the, the war in Donetsk and Luhansk, or parts of these territories, and fighting corruption. And of course, both did not happen to that extent. Um, he did not end the war, and corruption, uh, on the fight against corruption, he um, actually also continued some of his predecessors' uh, work on establishing an institutional architecture to, to deal with aspects of corruption, but the implementation is still behind. So um, th that is obviously uh, one of the, the key issues that will matter and matter a lot, um, or they do matter now, but they will also matter um, uh, hugely in the aftermath of this war. I see and I find it um, uh, telling that even um, amidst this war and the war of these dimensions, um, the president himself takes very clear actions when there are allegations or actually evidence of corruption now amidst war. And he's let people go, including from his closest um, uh, political circles. So that I take as further commitment in that direction. And it's also an issue that um, is high on the so on society's mind when people are asked, what, are the, what will they be the priorities of reconstruction? So looking beyond the war, they name fighting corruption as the absolute number one and only with quite some distance, things like reconstructing hospitals, schools and houses. And you could easily imagine that that would be the other way around. So I think in that sense, there's more continuity and it will continue. Um, but it's still, a, it's still a big issue. And the EU and its um, report on, on Ukraine has also highlighted those chapters of the EU are key most where where that work still needs to be done. And in terms of um, EU integration, it's closely linked to that. There was already, um, uh, under Zelensky in particular, also um, before him, but also um, uh, public opinion still widened or strengthened in that direction, a clear consensus on EU integration. And I cannot see that uh, that waiver at all at the, at the moment. Um, uh, the political landscape in Ukraine will look different after the war and we currently don't look don't know what it will look like there will have to be new parties there will have to be new opposition at the moment it's a system that still surprisingly manages to still i mean have a parliament and pass legislation and also important reform um, legislation is still being passed but obviously the implementation is already for mostly for a different era so we and we we don't know what the political scene will look like, but I don't currently, and what Zelensky's role in this will be, but I don't see any wavering from that um, drive for the rule of law and for EU uh, integration. And hopefully, may I add, um, hopefully in December, the EU will decide to, to actually open negotiations with Ukraine, which would be a very important um, uh, step in this process.
sorry, I at least can't hear you at the moment. I don't know if it's a problem on my end. No, the problem was on my end, so sorry about that. Um, I was saying that we have three um, questions that I think we can make our way through and not go above or, or beyond the allotted time. Uh, and the first is from uh, the Kennan Institute's own Michael Keyes. Uh, and the question is, how do you address critics who might assess Ukraine as a not very flourishing democracy, given that there are oligarchs controlling the country who are not really so different from Russian oligarchs when Poland bit the bullet and carried out shock therapy? And Russia carried out partial shock therapy under Yeltsin. Ukraine was seriously lagging behind. It did not seem to have the political will to carry out political and economic reforms that even Russia was carrying out. Might not Russia's intense interest in Ukraine joining the Eurasian Economic Union be based on its assessment that it was more of a candidate for that than, say, the European Union, which is so hard to get into? So a question about sort of corruption or the cor perception of corruption uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, yes, um, uh, clearly oligarchs um, had um, a lot of political influence, political power um, in Ukraine, um, but uh, and they might they might do so again in the future. We don't know that yet. But what we do know, and it's not going to be all the same oligarchs and all the same mechanisms. So clearly, any process of reconstruction and also EU accession will also bring funds into the country. Um, so there will be competition for that, I would assume that. Um, but uh, we don't really, as I just said, know what the political landscape will be. If, I mean, the worst outcome would be that um, new oligarchs, maybe not only a handful of big ones, but lots of um, smaller local ones uh, will, will become important. But at the same time, I um, am pretty convinced that this um, uh, societal uh, consensus on uh, fighting for the rule of law will uh, will be will be powerful beyond beyond the war. I mean, it currently uh, is an important element of the resilience of Ukrainian society, and in particular also what's happening at the local level. So those dynamics are really quite important. And I think um, there are all the makings of making um, the post-war system even more accountable. That doesn't mean that there aren't um, risks. I mean, the current centralization of the system and centralized, I mean, I mean, partly the president, but in general decision-making in wartime under martial law is centralized. That's the logic of it. Um, so there are clearly risks attached to that. How does one get from that to normal democratic politics? So at the moment to say that Ukraine is a flourishing democracy, would be wrong. It's a it's it's a it's a society, but it can't be any other way. But it's a society and a system that builds on the democracy that was established beforehand and the resilience, in particular, also at the local level, at the societal level. And that society is 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 um, uh, um, very mobilized, um, uh, obviously throughout uh, throughout the country. So what that ex how that exactly translates into what comes next? It's an open question. I cannot at the moment at all imagine a scenario where integrating into the Eurasian Economic Union uh, will look attractive. Uh, anything that Russia runs, and that's the case with the Eurasian Economic Union, will not be attractive for any foreseeable uh, future. And also Ukraine's economy has already reoriented itself. So it has big structural challenges inside, if we think of where industry is or was located, if we think of the huge um, uh, destruction of uh, an economic base. So these are huge challenges, but the economy and, and trade is already being and was already increasingly reoriented. So I think that is not, could not be presented as an easy option to turn the other way, even if there was eventually somehow political support for that, which I can't see um, uh, forthcoming. So the, the next question, uh, from Magamet Bachayev uh, is, in my experience, usually posed with reference to a quotation from Zbigniew Brzezinski, famous quotation that with Ukraine, Russia is an empire, uh, without Ukraine, Russia is not. This actually goes back to Otto von Bismarck. Please comment on the statement of Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor, that, quote, Russia's power can only be undermined by the separation of Ukraine from it, end quote. Though this was said in the 19th century, is it possible to draw any parallels between this statement and today's uh, reality? So I guess you could call it the Bismarck question. Okay, I, I, I don't think I like myself here in the position of agreeing with a, a statement by Bismarck, but um, uh, 
but nevertheless the at the moment um when i emphasized um that that it is about russia's self-preservation as um, the authoritarian and new imperial state it is um uh, it is of uh, essential um, uh, importance um, to to Russia to keep Ukraine close by and to basically, as I said before, with this against Ukraine title, um, it's about actually dissolving Ukraine into um, the, the Russian Empire. So, so yes, um, preventing that and, and Ukraine is doing its, its um, uh, utmost to prevent this from happening. Um, will be a safeguard. But let's not forget either that Russia also has imperial ambitions elsewhere, but Ukraine has and has also traditionally been of particular importance to the Russian Empire, to the Soviet Union, and also to post-1991 um, Russia again. But also in other parts that Russia's calls, Russia calls its near abroad, its neighborhood, and it's involved in every other unresolved or ongoing war in the region, it's not limited to Ukraine, but Ukraine has a has a particular importance. And if um, uh, uh, Ukraine, um, um, I don't even want to say the word, but disintegrates, or um, uh, if if Russia wins this war, um, it means it's not going to end there either. So it's uh, basically in that sense, uh, Ukraine's importance is is. Um, uh, yeah, is is greater, but it's not the only important um, imperial ambition that Russia has already acted on and will act on again. So this takes us to the end of our conversation, and, and, and it is, I think, a very suitable uh, question uh, with which to conclude from Yulia uh, Bidenko. Uh, and the question is, there is a huge demand for justice in Ukraine. How would you assess an ability in uh, of of current or of, of projected possible instruments uh, to hold Russia uh, accountable. So questions of justice and uh, and accountability. I think this is a, a perfect you know sort of final question. Yes, it's a, a very important question. Thank you, Yulia, and it's also one that needs more than a few minutes now. Um, uh, I mean, the, the shorthand answer is. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, the instruments uh, are not um, sufficient. Um, they take a long time to be put in place. But at the same time, maybe these things have to be thought of as something in the medium to long term. Um, and, and there are some legal instruments. International law provides for some. And uh, the evidence, I think that's the key um, challenge now, to collect um, the evidence of, of war crimes. Uh, there is already plenty of it, but in also to in order to hold up in courts, um, the evidence has to be of a kind that it can be used in courts in very kind of specific um, sort of settings and how it's laid out. Um, and that collecting, archiving um, that evidence, making that available is the first step towards that. Um, if it will ever feel like really um, doing justice and really holding Russia accountable, it will probably only ever be, as it has been in, in other historical cases too, um, one, one element, but it is incredibly important. And it, it is about certain individuals, Putin among them, but it's also about assets, um, Russian assets abroad, this question of whether they, for example, can be used for, for reconstruction. And it's also at a societal level, and that process will will uh, will take even longer than than probably than some of the the, the legal mechanisms at different levels. No, in Ukraine internationally, um, I don't know if ever even in in Russia one can't even imagine that being possible. But there will be all these different elements and, and instruments, and and ideally they at some point all. Um, uh, become part of, of, of one big process, but we are very far away from that. And we also already clearly see that the instruments are um, insufficient to react quickly. Well, thank you so much for, uh, you know, taking the time to join us. We're honored to have you as a, uh, as a participant uh, in a Canon Institute Longview um, uh, conversation. Uh, let me once again mention the title of the book, <laughs> as we've discussed over the last hour and 15 minutes. It's Russia, uh, Russia's War Against uh, Ukraine. It's come out two months ago uh, and uh, is uh, a wonderful book for those who haven't read it yet in German or in English. Uh, it's available now uh, in both languages. I would like to also thank uh, 
uh, Lenny Lopato and Victoria Pardini uh, and the staff of the Kennan Institute for making this conversation uh, possible. A few other things just to mention that for those who wish to sort of participate in ongoing Kennan Institute publications, conversations about the war and other topics, please take a look at the Kennan X uh, and Russia File podcasts. Latest analyses of the region uh, are coming out on the Russia File and Focus Ukraine uh, blogs. And as mentioned, we'll have another long view conversation on the 6th of December. But most importantly, um, you know, please join me virtually in thanking Professor Gwendolyn Sass uh, for joining us. Uh, and you know, the last thing I can say uh, is, is read the book. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for the conversation.